right, this video today is going to be looking at section 4.3 on separable equations. So we start with this idea of what is a separable equation. Of course, what we mean by separable equation is a separable differential equation. And the definition will go like this. A separable differential equation is any equation that can be as the following. The derivative of y with respect to x can be actually separated into two functions, a function of x times a function of y. And that's the key idea right there. If you can separate the right-hand side into a function of x explicitly and a function of y explicitly, then the differential equation is called separable. Now, the reason we care about this type of a differential equation is the ability to separate this right-hand side into its individual variables allows you to do a simple algebraic operation of moving all of the x terms to the left-hand side and all of the y terms to the right-hand side, or vice versa. For example, if I wanted to move this g of y to the right-hand side, I would simply divide both sides by g of y. And if I wanted to move this dx to the right-hand side, I would simply multiply both sides of the equation by dx. And so what you notice here is all the y's are on the left and all the x's are on the right. And because of this, because of this separation that we are able to do in a separable differential equation, now we can simply say if I integrate the left side and I integrate the right side, these will hold true. This equation will hold true. Now, if you could not separate the variables, if I had x's and y's here, writing this integral here wouldn't do you any good. You wouldn't be able to integrate it. Same thing over here. If I had x's and y's mixed and I wrote the integral symbol, while it may be true that the both sides are equal, I will, would not be able to integrate this. Now, let's take a look at some examples from the exercises. Let's start with problem number 120 where we're given the equation dy dt sorry, is equal to y minus 1 with the condition that y naught is equal to 0. This is an initial condition right here. It simply says that when t is 0, the value you'll get back from y is 0. This is another way to write the same thing that's written here. Okay? Now, <clears throat> this is a separable differential equation simply because we don't have any t's on the right-hand side, meaning I can divide both sides by y minus 1 and move the dt up here, and I have separated the differential equation. Now, in that separated form, I'm allowed to integrate both sides and say these are equal to each other. Integrating on the left, all I'm integrating here is 1 over y minus 1 which integrates to the natural log. Natural log of the absolute value of y minus 1. On the right, I'm integrating dt, which is just integrating 1 with respect to t. It gives me a t plus a constant of integration. Now, I have solved for y. It's right here. But this is all embedded within this natural log. I can actually solve for y explicitly if I peel off that natural log and then get rid of the minus 1. So solving for y explicitly, I want to get rid of the natural log. I'm going to exponentiate both sides of this equation. So e to the natural log of y minus 1 is e to the t plus c. The natural exponential and the natural log cancel each other on the left, giving me y minus 1. I'm going to drop writing the absolute value on that y minus 1 because on the right I have an exponential which is never going to be negative. I don't have to worry about that. On the right I have e to the t plus c power. Now let's go through this once to understand what this t plus c is going to do. 
the t plus c is a power on e it means I can write this as e to the t times e to the c. Think about your basic properties of exponents. If you have the same base and you multiply it together, you add the powers, don't you? So this e to the t plus c is the same as e to the t times e to the c. Now e is a constant and c is an arbitrary constant. That means e raised to the c power is an arbitrary constant. We'll call it capital C. And therefore I can write that capital C in front times e to the t. y minus 1 is this constant times e to the t. If I add 1 to both sides, I have solved explicitly for y. Now let's not forget that we have this initial condition here to apply. That when t is 0, y is going to come back to be 0. So we plug in 0 for t. e to the 0 is 1. 1 times c is c. 1 plus c is y, where the y value has to be the 0, right? So on the left-hand side, your y is 0 when t is 0. 0 is 1 plus c means that the c value is negative 1. And therefore, the solution to this particular problem, meaning this differential equation with the initial condition, is y is 1 minus 1 e to the t. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look now at problem 124 from the exercises. In problem 124, we're solving the differential equation written as y prime is tangent of y times x. Okay, now that y prime, I understand that means the derivative of y with respect to x based on the fact that I have y's and x's in the equation. separating the variables. This dx is going to come up here, okay, joining this x, and this tangent of y is going to go down into the denominator on the left. Now that I have separated the variables, I'm allowed to consider integrating both sides of this equation. Now, I have a tangent in the denominator. That looks a little bit daunting until you realize very simply tangent is sine over cosine. So if you're dividing by a sine over a cosine, flip the sine and the cosine and write it as a cosine over a sine. Now I can integrate this on the left easily. It's a simple u substitution. Letting u be the sine of y, the derivative of u is going to be the cosine of y. And so this is going to work out very nicely in a u sub. dy is 1 over cos y du. And doing the substitutions, the cosines of y cancel. And so on the left I'm integrating 1 over u. Now on the right hand side I'm just integrating x. These are two very simple integrals to solve. The integral of 1 over u, natural log of absolute value of u. Integral of x, 1 half x squared plus the constant of integration. We don't want to forget that. And now to solve for u explicitly simply exponentiate. Now as we did in the prior problem, and the reason I took some time to talk about that, this constant up here, this is like e to the half x squared times e to the c. And e to the c is just a constant. This constant up in the power, when added, simply becomes a coefficient, a different constant. So we'll call it capital C, e to the half x squared. Now, remembering that u is the sine of y, I have 
like this. And if I want y explicitly, well, simply take the inverse sine of both sides. And there you go. You have solved the differential equation. Oops, there we go. Now you can see it down here. We took the inverse sine of both sides of the equation just to write y explicitly in this form. Okay. All right, let's take a look at another example. This time we're going to look at problem number 128. In 128, there we go, I want to solve the differential equation. y prime is e to the y times x squared. Okay. So remember, y prime in this context, since their variables are y's and x's, that y prime should mean dy dx. To separate the variables, I'm going to bring the dx up here. I'm going to bring the e to the y down here. And there we've separated the variables. So now I can say let's integrate both sides of the equation. Well, this e to the y in the denominator is easy to handle if you just think of it as e to the negative y up in the numerator. Integrating e to the negative y, I get negative e to the negative y. And integrating x squared, I get one-third x cubed plus that constant of integration. And so let's see what happens to that constant in this problem, where I don't have a natural log, but instead I have an exponential. First thing is I'm going to get rid of the negative here. So I'm going to multiply the entire equation by a negative. Notice here. I still write a plus c. This c is not the same as this c. This c is the negative of this c. In other words, when you're multiplying through by a negative, just let the c absorb the negative. You don't know what c is. It's arbit arbitrary constant at this point. So don't worry about it. Just absorb the minus into it. All right, now to get rid of this exponential here, to get to the, the y, we simply take the natural log of both sides of the equation. Taking the natural log of the left, and the natural log of the right. I get this. Okay. Now, getting rid of the minus. Simply multiply both sides by a minus. And we have solved for y. Okay. All right, let's try another example. Number 134, where we have y prime equals y squared times x plus 1. And this time we have the initial condition that when x is equal to 0, y is going to be equal to 2. So this is an initial value problem that we're solving. Again, we have to interpret y prime based on the variables we see in the problem. y prime is going to be a dy over a dx. Separating the variables, that y squared is going to come down. The dx is going to come up here. And I'm going to integrate both sides. Now here, this y squared in the denominator, simply think of it as y to the negative 2. And so when I integrate that y to the negative 2, I get negative y to the negative 1. And when I integrate x plus 1, I get 1 half x squared plus x, plus a constant of integration occurring. Get rid of the minus by multiplying everything by a negative. Again, this constant, when multiplied by a negative, you don't have to bother changing the constant if you don't want to. It's an arbitrary constant. It can be negative. <coughs> All right, now, to get rid of the minus 1, you think of this as 1 over y. Therefore, you're reciprocating this y to the negative 1, and you're reciprocating the right-hand side as well. Finally, apply the initial condition here, that when x is 0, y is equal to 2. y is equal to 2 when the x's are 0. 
this is zero, this is zero, you just lift the C. One over C is two, so C is a half, and therefore your particular solution to this problem is, why is this reciprocal form minus x plus the constant, which is a half? And there's your final answer to this problem. Let's try problem number 142 next. In 142, we have the differential equation. Y prime is equal to negative 2 times x times the tangent of y. And we're given this initial condition that y when x is equal to 0, is going to be pi over 2. Again, interpret y prime as dy dx based on the fact that you have x's and y's in the problem. And separate your variables. Bring the dx up here, the tangent of y, bring it down here. This tangent is sine over cosine. So when I have to integrate this, I'm going to think of that sine over cosine flipped and brought up to the numerator as cosine over sine. <coughs> Using the same u sub technique as before in, the previous pre in a previous problem, u is the sine of y, its derivative is the cosine of y can very quickly get this left hand side to the point where it's the natural log of the absolute value of the sine of y. Integrating the right hand side, of course, negative x squared plus a constant. Now recall when you're getting rid of a natural log, you exponentiate. And this constant up in the power, you think of that as a constant as a coefficient when you use the fact that this is really e to the c, which is just an arbitrary constant. Okay. Now, we have to f write this solved for y. Okay. y is going to be the inverse sine of c e to the negative x squared, of course. You simply take the inverse sine of both sides. But I need to know what that constant is, and that's where I'm going to use this initial value. Now the interesting thing is you don't have to necessarily solve for c in this final step here. If you find it easier to think about solving for c in the previous step before you've applied the inverse sine, go ahead and do it. In other words, if you're more comfortable with sines than you are with inverse sines, as we all should be actually, go ahead and solve for c up here. Okay, That is this. If I put in 0 for x, the y value should be pi over 2. Sine of the y value, pi over 2, is this c times e to the 0 for x. In other words, the value of c, c times e to the 0 is just c, the value of c is the sine of pi over 2, which is 1. And therefore, the solution here is, now that we know c, 1 times e to the negative x squared inside that inverse sign. And we're done with that problem. Okay. All right, let's take a look at problem 148. Right. This is a uh, word problem. And in this word problem, what they tell us is that most drugs in the bloodstream decay according to the equation y prime equals c times y, where y is the concentration of the drug in the bloodstream. Okay, So this makes sense. What they're saying is the rate of change in the concentration of a drug in your bloodstream is equal to some constant times the amount of drug that's in your bloodstream. This comes from the idea of saying this. The rate of change in the concentration of drug in your bloodstream is proportional to how much drug is in your bloodstream. Meaning if you have a lot of drug in your bloodstream, you would expect the rate of change to be large. 
If you have a small amount of drug in your bloodstream, the rate at which you're going to lose that drug is going to be small. The rate of change is proportional to the quantity. And to get this to an equation, you simply introduce a constant of proportionality. That's where this differential equation is coming from. Now, they also tell us in this problem that the half-life of the concentration of the drug in the bloodstream is two hours. So every two hours you're going to lose half of the concentration. And the question is what fraction of the initial dose remains after six hours? Well, in fact, you could do this without doing any math and calculus at all. You just simple arithmetic. If you lose half of the drug every two hours, after two hours you've lost half. After another two, you've lost another half, so you're down to one quarter of the concentration. And after another two hours, for a total of six hours, you've lost another half. A half of that quarter is one-eighth. The concentration will be one-eighth. But let's see how we go through the mathematics of doing this, just in case they ask you something like, what's the initial dose remaining after 23.2 hours? Right? Where it doesn't work out nicely that the number of hours they ask you about is a multiple of the half-life. Well, that means we have to solve this differential equation. And so we consider this differential equation, the dependent variable y, and then the independent variable, which is not named in the problem, but we understand we're talking about time here. So let's just go ahead and use the letter t. To separate the variables, the dt comes up, the y comes down, and I integrate both sides. On the left, integrating dy over y gives me the natural log of the absolute value of y, and integrating this constant is just a constant times t plus another constant of integration. Okay. Now, solving for y here, I exponentiate. e to the d power is just going to be a constant. Call it capital D. So this is your model for the concentration of the drug in your bloodstream after t hours. It's some constant times e to the ct. Now let's use that half-life to figure out what this c is up here. The half-life is two hours. That means that if I start with a quantity of d, after two hours I'll have one half of d left. Cancel the d's. Solve this equation for c by taking the natural log of both sides and then dividing by 2. There's your value c, which of course can be written by the power properties of logarithms. This half can come up as a power as natural log of a half to the half. All right, now plugging that back in up here to this form, we get y is equal to this unknown constant d, e to the c, which is the natural log of a half to a half, times t. So t times natural log of a half to a half. Again, using the same property of logs that we did over here, that the coefficient can come up as a power, this t can come up as a power. So you have that y is d times e to the natural log of a half raised to the half t power. And now the interesting thing is here, the natural exponential and natural log cancel. And so you get the form y is d times 1 half to the 1 half t. All right, now when they ask us the question, how much or what fraction of the initial dose remains after 6 hours, that's simply asking you to evaluate this when t is 3 and compare it to when t is 0 where the concentration is d again at zero, at time zero. So at three hour, or six hours, sorry, at six hours, we get d times one-half to the one-half times six. One-half times six is three. One-half to the third power is one-eighth. And what we see is we start with D, and after three, three, uh, um, six hours, sorry, we're at one-eighth of D. So one-eighth 
remains after six hours? And there's our answer to the question. Okay. All right. Let's look at one final problem today. Let's look at number 166, which is another word problem for us to consider. <coughs> In 166, they tell us that leaves accumulate on the forest floor at a rate of 2 grams per square centimeter per year and also decompose at a rate of 90% per year. Okay? So the leaves are falling off the tree at a rate of 2 grams per centimeter squared of floor per year. But 90% of those leaves are also decomposing. Write a differential equation governing the number of grams of leaf litter per square centimeter of forest floor. Assuming at time zero there's no leaf litter on the ground. Does this amount approach a steady value? And if so, what is that steady value? In other words, as the leaves fall and as the leaves decompose, is there going to be a point where you just reach this perfect balance between the two? And eventually, it's not, the quantity is not changing. The decay, the quantity decaying and the quantity dropping balance each other out every year eventually. Is that what happens? Well, let's find out. Now, to write the differential equation, we're going to let y be what we are measuring in this, which is the, um, the number of grams of leaf litter per square centimeter on the floor, okay, on the forest floor, okay? And so our differential equation here is, how does that change, the rate of change per year? They tell us we are accumulating two grams every year, but we're also losing 90%, 0.9 or 90% of however much we have. And there's how we write the differential equation. And the initial condition is that at time zero, when we're starting this process, there is no leaf litter on the ground. Okay? So this is the initial value problem for us to solve. Now, as we separate the variables, this 2 minus 0.9y will come over to the denominator and the dt will come up to the right-hand side. Okay. Now I can integrate both sides. And again, this is a simple linear expression in the denominator here. This is going to become a natural log when I integrate it. The, we can write the u substitution out if you want to see it. So du dy is negative 0.9. So that means when you solve for dy, it's 1 over negative 0.9 du. And so I can come back over here and substitute in. The u is 2 minus 0.9y. The dy is 1 over negative 0.9 du. And so when I integrate this, I get 1 over negative 0.9 as a coefficient in front the natural log of the absolute value of u, and on the right, I integrate it to get t plus c. Now, to solve this for u, the first thing I want to do is get rid of this 1 over negative 0.9 on both sides. All right? So, I am going to have to multiply both sides by a negative 0.9. And again, when you multiply a constant by another constant, it's still just an arbitrary constant. So I don't have to rewrite the c. Just consider that's a different c at this point. Okay. Now, to solve for u, I exponentiate. And again, when you have e raised to a c power, that's just a constant. Now, remembering what u is, u is 2 minus 0.9y. I can now solve this for y. I subtract 2 from both sides. Okay. 
I then get rid of the negative 0.9 by multiplying both sides by 1 over negative 0.9. So that's negative 2 divided by a negative 0.9. This constant, when divided by a negative 0.9, is just another constant. And so what do I have here? 2, negative 2 over a negative 0.9. The negatives will cancel. That's 2 over 0.9 or 2 over 9 tenths, which is 2 times 10 ninths. It's just 20 over 9. Now, applying the initial condition. Recall this initial condition. At time 0, the amount of leaf clutter is 0 grams per square centimeter on the floor, meaning y is 0. e to the 0 is 1, 20 over 9 plus c is 0 means c is negative 20 over 9. And so the solution here is y is 20 over 9 minus 20 over 9 e to the negative 0.9t. Now that we have this particular solution to the initial value problem, sorry, now that we have this particular solution to the initial value problem, we can consider what happens as time goes on and on and on. Does this settle down to a constant quantity of leaf litter on the floor? In other words, as t gets infinitely large, what happens? Well, e to the negative infinity becomes 0. This term zeroes out. And you're left with 20 over 9. This asymptotically, as time goes on, approaches 20 over 9 grams per centimeter squared on the floor of the forest. Okay, And that's the last step of that problem and we are done looking at section 4.3. So please practice your problems and as always let me know if you have any questions or concerns.